Hello and welcome to Elements of Costing. What we're going to do today is BPP uh, practice assessment number one. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a practice through, or we're going to go through this one in here. I'm going to take you through the answers. What we're going to do here is I'll just fire up the, the tasks, so I've got them on screen. You can pause them, have a go yourself. Then what I'll do is I'll take you through the reasoning or the workings. And that's the key thing that we're trying to do in these practice assessments, is we're trying to really get our reasoning, why something's happening in our heads, right? Or we're trying to make sure that we've got really good, solid workings of how we get the answer. And that'll give you a very good exam technique that you can then take into the exam. Otherwise, you're just putting numbers in boxes, really, and you're not really going to be um, actually making any progress uh, with this unless you're actually really understanding the reasons why or creating a good, solid technique of, of how you get to the answers, really. So, without further ado, let's start with task number one. Uh, so we got uh, management uh, use costing techniques to help them for planning, control, and decision making. Yep, that's what this is about management decision making. Indicating the following statements are true or false by ticking the relevant boxes below. Fixed cost per unit rise as the level of output rises. And um, they don't. Um, fixed costs are fixed. So the overall fixed cost is fixed. So let's say we've got £100,000 of the fixed costs in here. And if we produce um, you know, 1,000 units, or if we produce uh, 100,000 units, then our fixed cost is going to be exactly the same. So our cost per unit would be, in this instance, with 1,000 units, £100 per unit. And in this instance, with 100,000 units, £1 per unit. So now, um, our fixed cost per unit, root 4, as the level of output rises. So that would be false. See what we've got next. Variable cost per unit falls as the level of output rises. No, it doesn't. Variable cost per unit stays exactly the same as the uh, as the level of output rises. So that would be false there. Um, you might see a trick then, let's say, if a semi-variable cost per unit falls as the level of output rises, that would be true because the, whilst the variable cost element would stay the same, the fixed cost per unit would fall. Right, LIFO gives the lowest uh, value of closing inventory if general prices are rising. Right, so what is LIFO? And the way we, way we will imagine LIFO is, let's imagine we've got some trucks, which I'm going to make in some, some, some boxes. Imagine that I'm some kind of impressionist here. Um, so I've got four trucks, okay? I'm going to bring along 100 units each. So each one of them is going to hold 100 units. And there we go. So each one's got 100 units on, the, on each truck. And the first lot costs £100, the next one costs 110 the next one 120 and the next one 130 right, And this is the best way to do, to do any kind of um, LIFO calculation. Right, so LIFO is saying that the last in is the foot is one that's sold. So, so that one's, so let's say at the end of this closing thing, we've got 100 units left. So that one's sold, that one's sold, that one's sold here. So we've said all of those ones have all gone, you know. And we're left with this. So that's the value of our closing stock. Okay. Now let's say we did it the other way around. And so that would be our LIFO. Okay. Let's flip it. And let's do, let's say, first in, first out. So first in, first out wouldn't be that one. It would be that one. We have 100 units left. There. Yeah. And AVCO would be or average average prices, so average average costs in there though. That would be the average of the whole lot, which would be okay, it's just average. So that is the total cost of them all, and so it would be that, that divided by 400 and times by the amount that we have left in this instance. There, it's 115. So last in, first out, first in. Last uh, first in first out and average cost in there um, with a hundred units in this one. So LIFO gives the lowest value of closing inventory if general prices are rising, and so that would be true because that is the lowest one of all of them. And that is the easiest way to think of it through is put your little uh, products on four little trucks and then uh, go through like that. An investment center can have capital accounts code into it. Yes, it, it, it can. That's, um, that's when you're just going through your, your various sort of ways that you're splitting your, your, your um, business up. You split it into those, those various things and an investment center would have capital accounts going against it. Okay, so that's our first part. Right, so the table below lists some characteristics of financial accounting. 
which is the legal accounting. You know, if I want to set up a company and have limited liability, I need to be able to have the price of that is that I need to produce financial accounts, which are available publicly and can be, you know, have to be put into public you know, company's house. And so they have to be done in a very particular way. And cost accounting. Well, I actually might want it for a different for our business in terms of the way in which we have. So to give an example here, here we have our LIFO and here we have, you know, we, let's say we're now producing um, we're a, a garage forecut and we've got petrol. And instead of these things that come on these trucks here, it's now oil. And the price of oil just went through the roof. So instead now it is £400 at the end of it in here. And so £400 there. And the 100, 100 units or 100 barrels of oil that's sitting in our in our sort of tank underneath our petrol pumps um, is now worth 400 pounds. Would I use uh, first in first out as a basis to um, now give my prices and start selling all this 100 units at you know whatever uh, a quarter of the price that it should be? I certainly wouldn't. Uh, I'd be looking at the current price of, of petrol and, and be selling using this sort of life or method. So, but that is not used in financial statements. So management, when cost accounting is management accounting used for, for making management decisions. So very different. Let's see what this now say. Statements of this system are used by lenders and suppliers of credit to businesses to assess whether they, uh, well, that's going to be financial accounting. And that's because remember, this is the publicly available set of data produced in a very specific way uh, and to make sure that we can then and use it. And so this is somebody external to the company. So they're going to make basis on, on the um, on the financial statements, they're not going to make up whatever you know, management decides to use internally. The information in the system is used for planning and controlling decision making. Well, that's not going to be financial decision making, that's going to be our cost accounting one, because we're setting it out in a particular way to make decisions. That's the point of, of, of the management accounting, sort of the cost accounting kind of method. So I'm going to give you the different wording as well. Typically, it's not used as cost accounting, it's called management accounting. Um, and they'll be called management accounts. The financial accounts will be called financial accounts and they'll be done yearly. The cost accounts or the management accounts, as they're really called, um, will probably be done every month. Um, so there's no legal requirement for the formats of this, in, this statements systems or this system statements. Well, financial accounting, as we've already said, that's, that's there to, uh, the reason for it is limited liability in companies. So there is a very legal format for that. Cost accounting, there's none for that. You can decide whatever you want. Um, this system incorporates non-monetary measures such as quantities. So we might have some extra data in there. Financial accounting wouldn't be talking about quantities or whatever, unless you might have things in the notes, but it's not really going to be like that. We very much about um, uh, no, so we would not have that. It's going to be very specific. That's going to be cost accounting, uh, management accounting. So that's the answer for that. Hopefully that gave you the reasons. Right, let's go on to task number two. So here's task two. If you want to pause it and then have a go at yourself. And right, let's have a go now. Okay, so pizzeria is a, is a fast food restaurant. Okay, and what we've now got here is classify the following costs incurred by behavior. Oh, fixed variable or semi variable. Right, so fixed costs are costs that don't change. Variable costs are they, they, um, you know, they move in the same proportion. So it's uh, things like the amount of metal we need or whatever. And semi variable has a, has a characteristic of both. So there might be a question that there's a salary payment to a salesperson but they also get bonuses on top uh, so the bonuses would be variable costs and the, the, the initial salary would be fixed costs so let's see where we're going restaurant lighting costs consisting of a fixed charge so this is a, a fixed charge so this is the charge to actually just have the connection to the energy grid in here and then we've got a usage charge and that is and uh, that's going to be going per you per unit that i use every kilowatt hour that i use for uh, lighting and so that's going to be semi-variable Okay, the salary of a restaurant manager. Okay, so if somebody's coming through the door and I start to do more sales rather than less sales, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to their salary, unless we had them on some kind of bonus or profit thing, but that's not in here. So that is going to be fixed. Okay, flour purchased for making pizzas. So if I make one pizza, I use a certain amount of flour. If I make 100 pizzas, I'm going to use 100 times that amount of, of flour. So flour purchased for making pizzas is going to be perfectly variable. One could argue slightly that there'll be a bit of waste or whatever in there, though, so it's semi-variable. In reality, everything's semi-variable, really. Uh, but no, in this one, it's going to be variable. Wages of a pizza maker made on a piecework basis. So what does this word piecework mean? Um, imagine something like uh, the gig economy for um, uh, you know, 
delivery or something like that. The amount I'm, I'm paid per unit produced. Okay. So this pizza maker is paid per you per um, pizza that they produce. So let's say they paid fifty pence a pizza or whatever. And uh, they do a hundred an hour. They've made made them you know, sort of. Uh, pounds isn't it and if they do and if they do so 10 an hour they made five pounds so that's what it is so this one is perfectly variable okay so you can see the difference here this was the salary of the restaurant manager it didn't change regardless how much we produced this person here where this word here called piecework in here what that means is it's I'm paid for the amount that I actually do yeah not really legal anymore, but anyway. Right, classify the following costs incurred by nature by ticking their relevant boxes. As a general, what we're going to see here is direct costs tend to be variable costs, indirect costs tend to be tend to be fixed costs. But direct costs are basically something that we want to attach directly to it, uh, directly to something. Indirect costs are something we're going to have what's known as overheads, really, which you know, it, we sort of put after our direct costs. We're trying to find something called the cost of sales here. So wages of the cobbler employed to wear to repair the boots. So you know this we've got obviously this this what is it is a walking boot shop. Okay, selling boots and making repairs. So we want to have what we've got is in terms of our income. Well, we sell boots and we make repairs. And uh, is this person selling boots and making repairs? Yeah, this person selling boots and making repairs. So they're going to be direct costs. Rent and rates for the shop, uh, shop and workshop. Does the shop uh, the, old, the actual shop itself and um, sell boots to make repairs well it doesn't it sort of sits there somebody comes into it and starts with selling boots so that's going to be indirect costs it doesn't really change either um licenses paid per item to boot suppliers to stock their boots okay it's paid per item all right here so this is an overall license then one would start to say, well, that was an overall, it was almost like a fixed cost that we're going to do direct cost. But they're saying very clearly here, it's price per item. And because it's price per item, you know, and it's sort of very, very variable and, and, and attached to the end of that, we're going to say that's going to be direct. Oil for the stitching machine. So, yes, it's a bit of an interesting one here. It's going to be indirect. Um, you know, one could argue, well, the stitching machine sort of like goes along, doesn't it? And if I worked it away all the time, then it'd be, it'd be quite direct cost, wouldn't it? Because it, you'd have a certain amount of oil going in all the time. It's not really, though, this oil is probably going to dry out or whatever. Uh, so we're going to go for indirect on that one. Uh, that it's some kind of overhead, really. OK, so that's the answer for question two. Right, let's have a go at question number three. So yeah, feel free to pause it now if you want to. OK, let's have a look what we're going to do here. So Dales Limited set up an investment centre for a restaurant project it's undertaking uh, over a period of months. It's going to use an alpha coding system for certain things. So what it's going to do is it's going to click up, do, cut its uh, coding system. And all the coding system is, is I put costs against particular things in there and I put a little code against it. It's almost like a stamp that I put on each, each uh, cost or each income that comes through in there. And it allows me then to sort of analyse it out much more effectively. Um, uh, give you some, let's say I'm going to go section number one, number two, number three, uh, three, then I'm going to go back to one, two, three, like that. Okay, and I've got some expenses in this instance here, like that. Okay, so that's something that's in the bank. Back there, though. I want to see, well, how much was against number one, how much was against number two, how much was against number three, right? Um, so actually how it's going to work really in an accounting system like that instead of having to sort them all out and then add them all up with the calculator and stuff uh, the underlying software of an accounting system would be setting up let's say that one was 400 pounds instead see how it's changing so that's why we use a, an accounting system really we stamp everything that goes through with particular codes and that allows us then to produce reports in, in here uh, in this instance this code has got these alpha codes here, these two letter codes, which sort of says that it's in this bit here, um, so it's in this sort of section. And then we got these, this second, the second set of codes here, which is this is the type of or the nature of the cost. Right. Okay. So, and I'll get it as IP 100. I'm not sure I'll change these ones around here a little bit. Um, IP 200. Uh, and then they'll go and we'll put. CO. Just useful to sort of see an actual accounting system going in practice. Uh, let's go um, RE100 there and smush it around a bit. Right, okay, and now let's change this. E100, 
So just a, just a way in which which we're just getting a, a, a system to just we put amounts in produces summarize it up on that so that's how it works right okay let's have a look now so what we're going to do is we've got we're going to work out the code okay so a solicitor's fees for arranging a bar license right so we're going to have um we've got a bar here okay um what we're going to go for is it investment? No. Is it revenue? Is it cost? So it's costs. And it's going to be overheads, isn't it? Because we're going to have costs. We've got overheads, fixed costs, whatever you want to call it, and uh, indirect costs. So we know costs, and we will go 300. Bar sales. So we've got our in revenues. So sales, another word for it, revenue, another word for it, turnover, another word for it, income. And so just in terms of there, we've got. And what you're going to see with it with an accountancy is that there's a lot of um, very much the sort of same thing for or different different words for the, exactly the same thing. So sales, turnover, income, receipts, anything like that. What we got here anyway. Um, so we've got revenues or revenues as well. There's another one of them. Right, so bar sales then is going to be RE and it's bar, so 200. Okay, fresh vegetables, so we're going to have costs. Bought in daily from local farmers. Um, costs at CO and it's going to be 100 for the materials. Okay, waiting for staff salary, so it's going to be costs, CO, and it's going to be labour, 200. And loan news for set up the restaurant and bar. That's going to be investments, isn't it? IV. And it's probably going to be external. 100. Okay. And then the security manager's salary. So that's going to be costs. And that's going to be labor. Okay. Now, let me show you how this would work in practice. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to push what the uh, center, so I'm going to code in there, and we're going to put the nature. Yeah. Sorry, we'll call it activity. So we'll follow the we'll follow the box and the code. Right. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here. So we've decided that this first one solicitors fees, which was costs. And then the nature of it was overheads, so 300. There. Now I'm going to just stick it together. Ah. Okay. So you could do it like this if you wanted to. So bar sales, we go RE, and we're going to go then, what was it? It's bars, 200. There, like that. So that's how that's how you could you could do it as well if you wanted to almost sort of do it there and then just stick them together and that will give you the, the answer right okay right so we are now in four task four and so I split that into two task four a task four b identify the cost behavior fixed variable or semi variable described in each statement by ticking the relevant boxes in the step table below okay uh, so we've got four thousand units at six pounds twenty five per unit and 5,000 units are five pounds per unit. All right, okay, so what we've got here then is what's known as the high-low method. We're gonna get given two uh, two figures, two figures for costs with two figures for units in there. And we're gonna try and work out whether the costs are fixed, whether they are variable or whether they're semi-variable. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is, and you go through the same method every time. So we set out the two figures. So 4,000 units and the cost is at six pounds 25 for that one. So times by six pounds 25. And that's 25,000. 5,000 units times by five pounds. So it's uh, times by five pounds. 25,000. Then what we do is we deduct them from one from the other. So 1,000 is the difference, and 5,000 is the, uh, nothing is the difference in there. And then the difference in here, the variable cost per unit is so the variable cost per unit is nothing so it is the difference in cost divided by the units so that's nothing 
And so the fixed costs is then pick a cost figure, so 25,000, and you deduct off the variable costs, so minus the variable costs of that figure, so nothing, times by 4,000, so the fixed cost is 25,000. So what we can see here is there's no variable cost at all. Uh, the fixed costs are 25,000, so this one is all fixed. And all you, the more important thing here is to do the same method again and again and again. Don't be trying to think or have little scrappy pieces of, of, uh, of answers all over your paper or whatever. Very neat table again and again. Right, okay then. Uh, let's now delete these ones out. Here. Yeah. At 12,000 units, the cost is 90,000. Oh, yeah, 90,000. At 14,000 units, the cost is 105,000. Okay. Let's just go through this again. So there's a 2,000 unit difference in here, and there's a 15,000 unit difference here. So we've got to delete this out now because we've got to adjust the figures. Right. So we've got uh, £7.50 per, per variable unit. So our fixed cost is equal to total cost, 90,000, minus the number of units times by our value per unit zero so everything is variable in that one okay and then five thousand let's delete this out again yeah five thousand units and the cost for that is twenty six thousand and eight thousand units and the cost for that is thirty five thousand okay so the variable cost per unit is three pounds and then when we, let's go through this again, so three pounds, and then we're going to take that off this figure, so that will be 15,000 pounds worth of variable costs, which means that the fixed cost is 11,000, so this one is semi-variable. Right, so that was pretty quick. I'm going to now explain why this, why this is, how you do this. So, this one here is equals to, right, so it equals the fixed cost figure, and it's going to be plus the number of units, the number of units, multiplied by the variable cost per unit. Okay? Same thing for each. Right. The fixed cost is going to be the same in each. The units is different in each and the variable cost per unit is the same. So if I deduct one from the other, those two go. So that, that minus that is zero. So that's nothing, isn't it? Plus there, this will be the unit difference in here. So whatever it is, unit one versus unit two. So feet 3,000. Yeah. And that will give me the price per unit, times by the price per unit. Okay. And one minus the other is going to be the difference in costs. So in this case, it'll be 11,000. Okay. Is it? No, sorry, it's 9,000. Right, so there's our difference. So that's now our, our equation. Okay, so to get our variable cost per units, we pull that, we, we sort of, uh, we're going to divide the 9,000 by the 3,000, so that's going to go off. So our variable cost per unit will be 3. Let's get this in now, we want it to. Variable cost per unit is equal to 3. And then we then stick that up here. We've got 26,000, so let's go back and do one of these. So 26,000 equals, right, so let's just put all that in. We now know that this is 3, and we know that this is 5,000. Yeah. So we can now deduct the 15,000 from the 26,000 to get our fixed costs. That's how it looks, so it's, it's, just, it's just algebra. Right, so that's the explanation for task 4a. Let's now have a look at task 4b, shall we? Okay, complete the table below by inserting all the costs of the activity levels of 2,000 and 8,000 units. Right, so what we've done here is we've been given a nice sort of uh, high-low method in the middle, like that. We're going to use that to find out what the 2,000 and 8,000, well, to find out the, the 7,000 and the uh, 750 and the 7,500 7, variable costs and fixed costs are, and then we're going to extrapolate that out in both directions. So, 
let's just now, the thing is here as well is this is a very tempting table isn't it it's not, let's make some messy um scrappy uh, calculations and poor workings there and then um drop them in instead of just using the really nice neat table that we set up so let's do it again our units and our total cost all right so here we go 4500 and the cost for that is 23750 and we've got 7500 and the cost for that is 34250 and we're going to take one from the other and we're going to take that from that there we go right so our fixed cost is not in this figure now so our variable cost per unit So that's you know that's the variable cost for three thousand units. So a variable cost per unit is going to be let's find out three pounds fifty. Our fixed costs must therefore be take one of those ones about twenty three thousand seven hundred fifty minus four thousand five hundred times by that. Right, so those are fixed costs. So now to make this then easy, what we do is we put our, those fixed costs in the same figure in all of those tables all the way along for like that there and now what we're going to then do is in the rest of it just have our 2000 uh, times by our three pounds fifty here what i'm going to do actually for just give you a bit of an idea about um uh, excel for level three i'll put this in a little equation for you for those of you that are doing um, uh, your level three synoptic, so that would be the answer there uh, um, for that. But now it's got a nice little equation form in here. So we've got our eight thousand units, our variable cost. So three point five, three pounds fifty times by two thousand. I'll drag that across to give all the other other figures. Uh, no, that's not working. Let me just. It's not that little dollar sign. Isn't it? Drag that across to make sure that it now works. There we go. So there's our variable costs. And there's our fixed costs. So we're now just going to add them together. And those would be the answers. So that's how it, that's how it would work. So let's come back and explain it here. Then we have these two figures in here. We take one from the other to get rid of the fixed costs. And that then gives us this amount, this variable cost for these 3,000 units. That then gives us the variable cost per unit, this figure here. And then we take that figure multiplied by the units from one of the cost figures. That will give us our fixed cost number. Our fixed cost number then goes in the table here. And we then work out the variable costs for each of these various level of units. Add them together, and that gives you the total costs of those particular figures. Hopefully that should help. Now you notice as well, I was even doing this in the equation method and then going through. It's because I wasn't thinking. And that's the important thing about this whole, whole approach is that um, I set out a method, we apply it, we go through we put it into our tables the key thing here is is the examiner is trying to get you to not use this table or, or have a guess shortcut or whatever in there and that's the only reason why you'd fail this 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 particular task is if you tried to sort of shortcut and had little messy uh, figures all over the place that's how pretty nice little table like that and then you can't go wrong okay so question number five right munchkin limited wants to calculate the total unit cost for one of its products it needs to calculate an overhead absorption rate okay so we're going to absorb some overheads in here and we're going to put it against a product it's the cost of one of its products it's considering the following methods so it's just considering the methods at the moment it wants to see the, what the effect is of each of them so we've got per machine hour per labor hour and per unit hour and what i'll do is I'll have a look okay i'll get to the end of it and then i'll explain why this happens so we've got total factor activities as follows Forty thousand machine hours 50,000 labor hours and 50,000 units and we've got 800,000 miles worth of overheads right first thing that we've got this is a nice little table so i'm going to put this in here so we've got our machine hours of 40,000 we've got our labor hours of 32,000 and we've got our units of 50,000 okay and we've got 800,000 pounds worth of overheads okay and so the absorption rate would simply be the overheads divided by whatever we've, we've got here. So it's if we use machine hours, so the amount of machine hours we used on this product, it would be £20 per, per unit. If we used labour hours, because we've got uh, 32,000 labour hours, it would be... Oh, just it would be £25 an hour. And if we just use simple units, it would be £16 an hour. Right, okay, so we've got three different... Um, 
different uh, rates depending on what we used. Right, now the following data relates to making one unit of the product. Calculate below the total unit cost using three overhead resorption rates you calculated in A. Okay, so if we used, uh, what we're going to do is materials, labour and production time. Right, okay. That's what we're going to absorb in terms of our cost in there. So, machine hours then. So the first bit in terms of the material and the labour, those are the direct costs. So they're going to be the same. So we use five kilos of this material at £12 per kilo. So it's going to be £60 for that. Okay. Then we're going to use 30 minutes or half an hour. At 40 for a person of labor and it's going to be 48 pounds per hour so that's 24 pounds and so our direct costs is 84 pounds now what we're going to have is we've got this different figure we're going to use the different absorption rates here so we've got these rates and this is machine hour we use 45 minutes of machine hours so it's going to be 0.75 times by 20 pounds per hour, so 15 pounds per hour for that one. Now labour hours in here, we use half a labour hour in here, so it's going to be that divided by two, so it'll be 12 pounds 50 for that one, because we only use 30 minutes there of the labour, and the units, well it's one unit, and the unit rate was, was 16, there. and then we add them together, and that gives us our cost. So a lot of this is about lining up the right the right thing really. So let me just put a little shape in here. Okay, so machine hours was the production time. Yeah, so that was that one. The labor hours, it all is there's labor time in here. And the units, we'd already worked that one out in terms of per unit up here. There. Now why was this important? Well what we can see here is that we're giving different costs different amounts that it cost to be able to produce each unit. So if we did this absorption based on the basis of units, it costs £100 per unit. Yeah. If we did machine hours, it's 99 and this is there. Yeah. So now, why? what's going to be interesting here is, is let's say if I was producing a set of accounts and I wanted to show the highest um, final uh, stock figure and I was using first in, first out. Uh, let's say, um, or, or, but I'm going to absorb these overheads into my stock figure. If I use this figure in here, this one, I've got a higher stock figure than if I use that one. So I'd have better profits because I get the stock figure would be higher. So I'd, I'd make more money. But let's say that I am the manager or, or I am the, the person who actually produces uh, this particular unit in here. And there's other people, you're, you're another manager in there, and you're, um, you're producing units as well. And we each get a, a proportion of overheads sent into our individual accounts. And we're taking home a bit of money based on the profit of each of our products. Well, if I could persuade the finance director to use labour hours as, the, as a basis, then the cost or the amount of overheads that's been sent to my unit is, is lower. Yeah. So more must be getting sent to yours. So my profit will be higher and yours will be lower. You're going to sit there and say, well, actually, I think we should be a per unit regardless in there. And so you want, want to put there. I said, well, hang on a second here. Um, you know, these overheads are things like HR. So surely it should be based on labor hour. And you'll say, well, OK, but no, it's not really. It's all the energy and the heating and lighting and the maintenance of the machine. So you'll want to use machine hours. And so these will be the arguments that go over backwards and forwards. Um, really, it's about the profits of each of our products in there. And so... I'm saying, no, no, forget that. It's going to be on the basis of HR um, and these people wandering around and using the canteen and what have you. So it's for labour hours and we'll get the lowest price there. So that's the reason why we have we have these different methods in there um, because different managers are arguing the, arguing the case and the better manager seems to have got. Or alternatively, the centre wants to try and produce the highest uh, uh, closing stock figure. Or alternatively, the lowest, lower closing stock figure because they want to show a lower profit. Either way, this is how it works. Right, number six. Let's see where we are now. Then. Um, so, number six then. Flory Limited wishes to know how fixed costs, variable costs, and total costs behave at different levels of production. Fixed costs are £24,000 and variable costs are £3.30. Okay. And this is to try and get some kind of idea about um, what would our demand be 
what would our so we get some kind of idea how much does it cost us at each different levels of demand if we produced it and therefore how much should we sell it for you know if we can the lower number of figures we're going to have a, have a higher fixed cost per unit so we're going to have to have a higher price lower ones can we sell this lot and get it out and, and still make make money so let's see what, what happens here so fixed cost twenty four thousand. okay which is going to be the same regardless variable costs are going to be three pounds per unit so we're going to have see what i'm going to do is i'm going to get rid of that i'll just do a little bit of excel whilst we're whilst we're here just so you're getting used to it um for later on so there's our our total number of units and so it's equal to that times by three pounds thirty there you go our total cost would be those two added together and you can see how I go into the little the little green square on the right hand side there and just drag it down uh, and so then our unit costs would be the total cost divided by this initial amount here so 11 pounds and what we can see here is see how our unit cost drops because what's happening here is our fixed cost is being spread over more units so we can sell this cost you know, so let's say somebody comes to the door and they just want 3,000 units and that's going to take up the whole of our production for the for the year or whatever. Well, they're going to have to pay at least £11.30. Somebody comes through the goals and goes, well, no, actually, to be fair, I want 12,000 of them. You're going, well, OK, you know, it's not going to be £11.30, it's going to be a bit more than £5.30. So it's, it's that kind of idea about how much for how how much in terms of, say, production runs or what, what have you. Um, and it gives us an idea about what price we're going to be able to charge. We need to charge a lot more. If we're going to just just lose three thousand pounds um, amount of units, then if we can sell twelve thousand. Okay, so that's number six. Okay, right number seven. Uh, we ordered the following costs into a manufacturing account for the year ended thirty first of December. So what we're going to have in the manufacturing account is we're going to typically work out the costs of our our products uh, first. Uh, then we're going to uh, put on some kind of or add some kind of overheads onto it there take off um, some stock figures, either work in progress or finished in stock there though, and to get some kind of idea of the cost of goods sold. Right? So that's what the, pretty much the order that we're going to go into in here. So we're going to try and find our direct cost, well, so of our opening of raw materials first, then we're going to go labour. So let's, what I'm going to do here then, if this is a draggy one, easier for you in the exam this, because you get to drag it nicely, it's going to be a bit of a pain to me, but let's see how we're going to go for. Uh, closure and inventory working pro opening inventory of raw materials is going to be the first thing. So that's going to be um, open raw materials is going to be the first thing, and that is going to be let me make that one bigger because that's what we're going to do. Okay, so that's cleared that one off. Seven five zero oh, oh. and okay, let me put a little thing there. Right, um, closing inventory of raw materials. It's going to go, it's going to be in the third one along. And so that's going to be 5,600. So now what we're doing is now we're looking for the purchase of raw materials. I suppose this gets a little bit easier the more we go along, doesn't it? Uh, purchase of raw materials is here. What I think I'll do is I'll use a little color this different colour hours so we can sort of see what's going on. Purchase of raw materials. Well, we've got 13,000 there. So we're going to see some form of direct materials used. There we go. There we are. Direct materials used. Tilt figure there. Now the direct materials used is going to be the opening raw materials because we've used that plus any purchases that we've, we've had and minus the closing raw materials that we've got left okay so that's what the cost is of our of our direct raw materials coming forward and that's what it would be um oh look and it goes into that figure down there so we can put that one down there 14,900 there okay Right, so that's cleared our first lot. Then what we're going to have is probably some kind of labour one. Let's see whether you've got any kind of labour. We have, we've got direct labour here. Um, that one there. Let me change the colour of that. Okay. Direct labour. Now, just a quick skim. 
no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no sort of labour crawl forward. Okay, you could have some kind of holiday accrual or something like that, or labour accrual, but we don't see any of any of that. So that's okay. Um, that would be a bit complicated for this level. Right, so we've got our direct labour and we've got our our um our materials. Let's see what we've got else here. Manufacturing costs would have to have our manufacturing overheads in, so that's going to come later. Uh, cost of goods sold is going to be the last thing probably. Um, so there we go, direct cost. Cost in here. So let's just insert our direct cost into there. Direct cost, and that's that one there. Uh, change the color to that. Right, oh, there. Okay, so direct cost is going to be our materials used plus our direct labor. There we go, there's direct cost. And that's cleared off the first set there. Right, now what we're going to see next then is some form of overheads being applied, and then we're going to then take off all of our stock figures. So let's put a little. Let's put a little in here. So what we've got, we've got manufacturing overheads here. Manufacturing overheads here. And that's going to go there. Okay. 10.0250. Okay. And this is going to give us our manufacturing costs. Right, manufacturing costs we incurred within the, within the period, really. So I'll put use the same colour for that one. Manufacturing costs, and we've got manufacturing costs. Okay, so add those together. So the total cost of what we actually spent in that uh, was thirty-seven thousand nine hundred fifty in our manufacturing costs. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take off. Uh, we're going to make some stock adjustments. So in two stock adjustments, I think we have. We've got work in progress there, and we've also got some finished goods going on there, and that'll give us our total our total cost of uh, total cost. Yeah. Okay. So we've got first of all, then we're going to have our opening whip. I'm going to have our closing whip. Uh, to get the cost of goods manufactured, probably. Yeah, cost of goods manufactured. It's quite a long one, isn't it? Uh, cost of goods manufactured. And um, we're going to have our opening finished goods and our closing finished goods. To get our Cost of goods sold. Let me go through here. Let's find the opening whip one. Oh dear, I'll get this all in, and then we'll then I'll explain it through how it, how it actually works. So, closing inventory finished goods. All well, that was going to be that one there. So we can put that one there. So that's one forty-five. No. The one big advantage is when I did this and you didn't have electronic um, exams, at least you had to do this and memorize it and write the tables out yourself. So, closing whip there, it's 8,300. 300. What have we got left? I'll finish all those ones off. Cost of goods sold to the last one. Next then, open inventory of whip, yeah, work in progress. And 850. Just as a general, why am I sort of whip it all the time? Um, it's not because I've just got the song going in my head, although I have now. Um, it's because that's, that's the term that tends to be used. Uh, opening of finished goods. There is put four six oh oh. Okay, so let's just go through our manufacturing cost. We've already got there nine seven three oh. Now, so what we would do is we would add on our initial working progress, and we would take off our closing working progress, and that gives us our cost of good manufactured, and then so we produce it, and that has how much the goods that we manufactured in the year. 
the cost us. Now we started off from last year with 44,600 in our warehouse. So we add those together. And we've still, at the end of it, we've got 45,700 worth in the warehouse. So we take those off. And that gives us a total cost of goods sold. So essentially what you're seeing here is, is the cost in any period is the opening cost, opening stock of something that we might have. So here we've got raw materials, here we've got work in progress, and here we've got finished goods. You add that on to whatever the thing is, so here raw materials, and you take off whatever you've got left, you know, because that gives you what actual what you've used in the period. You know, so if you started off with you know hundred pounds um you know in the bank and you spent uh, sort of uh, well at the end of it you've got um you know hundred pounds as well and, and somebody put in five hundred pounds within your bank, you know you spent five hundred pounds. All that's all it is, it's just, just a straight up bit of maths really. So that gives you those those figures. In terms of the order, we sort of start from uh, from sort of production in its rawest form all the way through to finished. So we start off with our raw materials, we add on then our labour, somebody comes in and does something to it. Then we add on our manufacturing overheads because that comes in next after labour because it's a little bit more and more further away. And then you start taking off your uh, your working progress uh, figures. That gives you an idea of the goods manufactured. So what's gone in and out of your warehouse in there. And then these are then the movements in and out, the, well, sorry, the, what goes into your warehouse. And then these are the goods finished goods adjustments what what moved around in your warehouse so almost if you imagine the sort of the production line from when it came in to when it will goes through into into your warehouse and then jiggles around any warehouse that's that's it and so this idea here of this whip thing actually what it is is imagine we got to the end of the day and we're on the stock we're on our manufacturing floor there's a manufacturing accounts there and we've got some bars of steel around there that people have been working on and we've got some sort of things that we it's, it's, it's what is sort of in progress in there so it sort of starts this this was you know goods in bit with all of our own materials it came we came out of that went onto the stock shop floor so it's out here now it's in whip let's say in here this person came in they're on the shop floor and they're working away and they've been those closing whip figures actually as well and then it came out we'd finished it and we sent it off into the warehouse and that's the salesperson's mm -hmm. thing and the reason why is because we've got different people involved in here this is the purchase in person this is the manufacturing person over your know, overseer in the on the, on the shop floor of the engineering workshop and this then we're getting down to the salesperson okay so those are our figures in here let's see oh this is quite nice we've got them all set out there so we've got our direct cost which was twenty seven thousand seven hundred quite nice and our manufacturing cost which is 37,950 and the cost of goods are manufactured which is 39,500 uh, the cost of goods manufactured is 39,500 and the cost of goods sold 38,400 okay right. now the key thing here was I suppose really the trick here, this was an electronic version here, um, so you were sort of dragging these things across and putting them in there. It wouldn't necessarily have these sort of figures calculated out, so you then start to scrabble around a little bit and, and put it in there. If you were very messy in your work and you'd get those wrong because you just simply put them in the wrong places, you'd have to put them in that table, nice and neat like that. Really. Um, so that is the answer for that, and really as a test of neatness and also as a bit of memory, but as a to help help your memory start from when it starts to be produced, getting to sort of an overhead, add the overheads on there, and then start adjusting for all of your stock. This is stock on the work floor. This is stock in your actual warehouse. Right, let's move on to question eight then. Okay, you are told the open inventory of a single raw material in the stores is 6,000 units at £2.70 per unit. Okay, it's raw materials. During the month, 5,000 units at 8 were, were received, and the following week, 9,600 were issued. Identify the manipulation methods, dragging the correct statements in there. So we've got first in, first out, last in, first out, and average cost. And as I've sort of produced already, or explained already, imagine we've got some kind of trucks. Get those in your head beforehand, and let's just have three of them in this case and here, that they came along. Um, and actually, the first lot came into the store and they had 6,300 on it. Now, we had 5,100 there. Right, and let's just put this in two different figures. Let's say 2,100 uh, on one truck and 3,000 on another truck. Right. Um, 
doesn't matter actually at the same at the same rates okay and in the following week 9600 are issued okay so they go out right statements closing inventory is valued at what that all right so we've got to actually work work out what the figures are so let's go for first in first out then and i'll just, i'll get rid of that last truck because it's a pain right 5100 and we open up with 6,300 times by £2.70. Okay, and in the second one, we've got 5,100 times by £2.80. Okay, and then we've got, so first in, first out then. So what we've got then here is uh, the cost of sales. It's going to be our opening stock to me that we're going to receive so opening receipts closing okay we receive that there okay um Closing stock. So closing stock is going to be here. Yeah, we've got 9,600 in there. So that was was 6,300. So, so that was the number of units there. And our closing stock. We've been issued issued 9,600. So our closing stock is 180 1,800 1, units. So we've got 1,800 units, and we're going to give a price per unit. First thing first out is going to say we're going to use this first. So that's what we used up first. And now we've just got whatever's left on this truck that's coming afterwards. So 1,800, then 1,800 times by 2.8. So that's our closing inventory. Yeah. So that was first in, first out is that one. So that one, uh, let me put the shapes in. That one is that one. So put them on the trucks or whatever you want to call them there though. And so we use up that one first. We had a bit of that left in there. 1,800 of that left in there though. So we're using that times by 2.8. So that one is the first in, first out one. Last in, first out uses this one first and that one last. So last in, first out. The closing one is going to be... Closing one is going to be 1,800 times by whatever the unit rate was at the starting ones, 2.7. So 4860. So that one is going to be that there. Okay. Now the issue of 9,600 units is costed at this here. So what we're going to do under under average one is we're going to add together our units. We had this already, 11,400. We're going to add together the total costs. So we that. I'm going to work out what the average cost is. So divide them there, there. And then we're going to multiply that by the 1,800. Um, OK, so that will be a close. Oh, we don't need that. Actually, we're not very right. OK, sorry. So we've got the average cost here. And so we're going to have to, the cost of those is, nine, so that cost of 9,600 would be that. There we go. There we are. And it was always a useful test to make sure that we got all of them working away because we could have just abandoned that. So in the average average one here, we didn't bother about what order the trucks came in. We just added all the quantities amounts. We added up the total cost of those there. And we divided one by the other, which gave us £2.70 for whatever it is going on. And then we multiplied that by the 9,600 units and that gave us the cost. We could have, well, yeah, and so that gave us the cost anyway. So that, that's how we would do it. Now, the easiest way to do LIFO, FIFO, and AVCO is literally put your costs onto little trucks. Right. Uh, identify whether the following statements are true or false. And you notice how I'm being quite neat in there now. Avro, AVCO values the cost, the closing, values the closing inventory at uh, 5,040. So that one would be false because Av, ooh, does it? Let's just check it, shall we? Hang on. So we have this unit right here, 274, two, I'm going to multiply that by the 1,800, and it doesn't. So it didn't value at that one. I thought that was FIFO, so that one's going to be false for us. 
That one's a false one. LIFO cost issues, this is the cost in LIFO, 9,600 units, will be that though, right? Okay, so we're gonna go for LIFO then. So LIFO would be this lot first. So it's going to be, let's do now cost, so we're gonna have opening costs. Come in. It's gonna be that. And then we're gonna have the receipts. going to be that okay and then the closing we're going to deduct under lifo we've spent that lot there though that was the first one so it's 1800 of this what was on this truck right so it's 1800 times by uh 2.7 and so the value here is that plus that minus the closing figures 2460 so that one's true yeah. And you notice how it's sort of pretty full, but as long as I keep doing the same thing, I can't get my, my addition wrong. That's the important thing. FIFO costs the issue of 9,600 units at 26,250. Okay, well, I did that already in there. And I have put the thing on the first, that's the opening sales. I put my receipts in here, and then my closing sales. I used those first, and it was 1,800 of this, which was um, 1,800 times by 2.8, wasn't it? Okay, and my cost of sales is the opening stock plus the receipts minus the closing stock. That was true. So false, true, true. For that one. And that's task eight. Right. If you were, should just got us to there. Right, let's get on now to task number nine. Let's see where we are in here. Ripon Limited has the following movements in a certain type of inventory into and out of its stores for the month of October. So we've got receipts. This feels like a sort of a, a yeah, we've got first in, first out, last in, first out, and average cost. Okay, so we've got some receipts in here. Notice how now we've got time in here. So we've actually got these little trucks coming along. And we've got this issue in here as well. Complete the following tables for the cost of issues of clothing inventory on... So the cost on the 18th in here, and then we've got a closing stock. So what we do is just simply create your little trucks and put them on. In here we've got three issues first of all let's do those calculations first okay so we have 300 and they're going to cost us 900 in the first truck that comes along in the second one it's got 600 on and they cost us 2400 and in the third one we have 500 on this truck and that cost us 2500 all right Okay, so first in, first out in here, we've got 1200 coming in, so it's going to use up this 300. Let's just I'll put this here. So it's using this, this 300 and that 900. It's using this 600 and that 240. And then we've got to get another 300 out of this truck. And so that's going to be 300 divided by 500 times by 2,500. So that was how much we've used. We've used all of that truck, we used all of that one, and we used a bit of that one. We used most of it actually, but, but that, that's what we've used. And so 1,200 units, and it's 4,800 pounds is the cost of the issue. So 4,800. We'll see what the closing inventory is in the end. Right, let's do LIFO next. So LIFO uses this truck first. So 500 units and 2,500. It then uses this one, 600 units, 2,400. And then it uses this one, 100 units. And so that would be 300, isn't it? A third of that. There we go. Okay, so that is our LIFO one. And then AVCO. AVCO doesn't matter about the number of trucks. All it does is it goes, right, it is, there's the total number of units, and there's the total cost of all those units. Right, so we're going to send out 1,200 of them, and that is going to be uh, that. 
1,000 times 1,200 divided by 1,400, and that's the price of our ad cost. So that's what our cost of the issue is 4971. Okay, so that would be our cost of our issue. We're now going to complete our closing inventory. So what we've then got in here is we take this truck here, whatever we've got left, or, or take that truck. So we've got our work out what our, our closing stock is. So in that under FIFO, it's the 200 that's left on this truck that we've still got in here, and that is worth a thousand. Okay, so let's get ourselves a starting position under LIFO. It would be the 200 that's left on this truck, and that would be worth 600. So that's where you are. So, so we used up 100 or 100 of this truck in here. We'd use up these ones in the LIFO, so that would be what the value of the stock is. And then under AVCO, we've got 200 left, and it's the difference between those two. Right. So that's what we've got so far. Then something else comes in, another truck comes along. Okay, so this other truck's come along, it's got a thousand on it, and it costs six thousand quid. Right, so a thousand comes on, costs six thousand. So they're closing one thousand two hundred units and seven thousand pounds. That's seven thousand. All right, so it was seven thousand for that one. And then we'll do this one in here. It's going to be the same thing on each. And let's just so that's going to be six thousand six hundred there, and six eight two nine. So that's the answer to task eight. And the real key thing here, apart from being neat, is to actually physically lay out what's going on here with this stuff by putting them on little trucks like that. Right, little square boxes here, but I don't even draw me little trucks. And, and, and just do it like that. And it's the easiest way to do it because then you can be there going through and just crossing them off um, and seeing where, where you're up. Because it's this little bit about what is the stock that's left? Which truck did you actually pick it from? In FIFO, it was the... 300 or two or 300 of them, the, of the last one which we used to get out to 1200 and the life it was 100 the first one and Avco it didn't it didn't matter right so that's the answer for task number nine let's go on to task number 10 right task number 10 during a 35 hour week so an employee paid 20 pounds an hour and expected to make 25 units an hour for any excess production the employee will be paid a bonus of £45 pounds a unit. So this is right. So here we go. So we've got a person in here. They're paid a specific amount per hour, but they're going to get some kind of bonus uh, going on. Um, feels very sort of semi variable. Let's see that. During a 35 hour week, the employee produces 875 units and in total pay of. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so 35 hours a week times by. 25 units an hour is 875 pounds. Sorry, 35, 35 hour week, and they make 25 units per hour. Okay. So they make 875 units. So in this instance, they've made 875 units, so they got no no bonus whatsoever because they've just made exactly what they should have done so there's no excess units so what they're going to then earn is their rate 35 pounds or 35 hours times by their rate which is going to be 20 pounds an hour 700 pounds okay so if they just produce exactly what they're supposed to produce they're going to produce that at their best that's going to be true during a 40 hour week the employee produces 1,100 hours and there's a bonus there. So let's see how much they should have, in 40 hours, they should have produced 25 units, 1,000. They actually produced 1,100, so they got a bonus. So they produced 100 more than they should have done and that would be times by 45 pence per unit. So they should get a bonus of 45 pounds, which they have done, right, 45, that's true. During a 39 hour week, the person produces a thousand units. 
Okay, so 39 hours times by what they should produce per hour, 25, 975. They produce 1,000 units, so they should produce, they've got an extra 25 that they should have, so we'll times that by 45 pence. So they got that in the bonus. And they should also get then as well their 39 hours times by 20 pounds an hour. Add those two together. That's not the same. They've not been paid for their bonus in the last one, so it's true, true, false on that one. That one's simply there, but again, at the same point, you know, lay your, you know, lay your numbers out neatly and see how things go. Right, Settle Limited pays time rate at £10 an hour to its direct labour for a standard 35.7 hour a week. Any labour uh, force working in excess of 37.5 hours a week is paid an overtime rate of £12 an hour. Okay, so we've got basic wage, we've got some overtime, we've got some gross wage in here. Okay, right, so Mr. Crane, he does 37.5 hours, with Mrs. Crane actually, to be fair, at £10 an hour, £375. There's nothing for overtime because they're, doing, they're not doing any overtime in there, and so the gross would be that. Okay. So Mrs. Crane, let's say, um, does 39 times by £10 an hour in terms of their base. No, actually, no, I wouldn't know. It would be 37.5 times by 10 for their basic. So that's their basic wage. That's what they should be doing. Then they've got this other one. So they've got another 1.5 hours. 1.5 hours times by... 10 times by 12. Oh, sorry, I know it's just times by 12. Sorry. Normally you have sort of like saying something like time and a half, whatever. So it wouldn't. It would be just uh, the extra 1.2 times by. Uh, sorry, the extra 1.5 times by 12 pounds an hour. Add those two together, and that will give us a gross pay of 3.93. That was that really. Um. So again, the uh, test of neatness really is, is, is all that this is, and just dropping the figures in the right right way. So the ba it tells you what the basic standard week is, so that will create the, the, the basic wage, and then it's gonna, you're going to deduct that off from the hours that actually work to give your your number of hours in the overtime, multiply that by the overtime rate. Sometimes you'll get that at like £10 an hour as the basic, and then time and a half or something like that will be in there, but that, that would be the answer for question 10. Okay, so task 11. Joyce Limited wishes to pay its employees using either the time rate method with a bonus or piece work method. Time rate method is £11.75 per hour, and employees expect to produce 10 years per hour. Anything all this is bonus. There. Okay, so what we've got is we've got two numbers of hours worked here, some output here. We're going to put the numbers in, in here. No bonus entered, just put a zero in. All right, let's just create the little table. We've got basic, and we've got our bonus. And we've got a gross, and then we've got the piecework alternative. And I'll do the, t and we've got, and we've got 35 hours worked, Ooh, 35, and we've got the number of units. So 590 and 570 and 40. Okay, right. So the piecework method, let's do that one first because we can just clear clear off and write that one out. There's one one pound ten per unit. So times that one point one pound ten per unit. Doesn't matter really how many hours I worked or not, that's what I'm gonna get. So those are the those are the two piecework methods in there. Now under the other one, then notice we've got a own a, a flat rate of £11.75 p per hour worked. Okay, so 35 hours times by 11.75 is that, and for 40 it's 470. Right, and then what should they have put? And it might be a question of, of putting a little column in here that what should this person have produced? So they should have produced in 35 hours 10. They produced should have produced 350. Right? And at 40 hours they should have produced 400. They didn't. They produced 590. Ooh, going. Uh, so he would take off the 350 for that. Okay. And we would multiply 
the difference between the two, so the 240, 240 pounds, you get 90 pounds per unit. That's quite good, isn't it? Okay, 216. And for this person, they should have produced 400. They actually produced 470. We multiply that by 90 pence, and we get 153 pounds. So that's those are our bonuses there. So our total amount would be the basic plus the bonus to give us our gross there. And we can then compare that to the piecework method there. So that's that. Now, as a general, I suppose really what we could see here is the piecework method did better than the basic. I suppose this person heavily overproduced um, what you should expect, and this person was quite close to the close to the mark. So yeah, okay, that's 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 pretty much how that would work. Right. So those that would be the answer to that. There's not really much to that. I suppose the, the thing that I did here was by doing it in my workings, I put there almost the what should should produce and I could have actually put the difference in there and multiplied it up it's in here of they should have they actually produced that they should have produced that and so I could multiply up the bonus but if this was a negative figure there would be just zero in the bonus uh, but but as it's not then uh, that would be probably a better question actually to upgrade. So let's say this person would have produced um, 390 or something like that. That would have been quite, quite a clever way of, of showing that. Right, so that's number 11. Let's do number 12. Number of statements about variances set out in the table below. Identify whether the following statements are true or false. So, variances. Now, what a variance is, is should have been this. So, it should have been this. It was actually that. Actually, this. Right. Typically, what it would be is budget actual. Right? A positive variance is something where it's gone well. So we've got a budget. So we've got a budget for costs. The costs were less than that. Positive variance. Um, an adverse variance could be it's worse than it should be. So budget for income is less than the income. Adverse variance. So positive variance, good. Adverse variance, bad. You know, so more money than we should have had, more income than we should have had, good. More cost than we should have had, bad. So just make sure you get that in your head before before we start. Identify where the following statements are true. Budgeted sales, we've got income, 4,000 at 20 pounds, 50 pounds per unit. Actual sales are that. Right, okay, so budget the sales would be 7,000 7, times by 20 pounds, 50. There's our budget. That's the income we should have had. We actually had 144,000, we've got 500 pounds more than we had. Marvellous. Positive then. So that's a positive one. Uh, oh, the sales variance is favourable. Different version for favourable is positive. Nobody's ever used a favourable variance. It's always been positive or adverse. But positive or, well, yeah. Right, so um, we're going to go and I'll use favourable then if that's what they want to use. Uh, let return to the 18th century. Right, a favourable cost variance uh, when an a favourable cost variance occurs when an actual cost of 5,800 is compared to. Uh, yeah, oh, it's favourable, so it would be true, wouldn't it? Right. Favourable. So the favourable cost variance occurs when an actual cost of 5,800. So actual 5,800. And this is you are in this particular question always set this out almost like you would see in a set of management accounts. Really, there's the actual 5,800. And compared to a budget cost of fifteen pounds per unit for a budget output of nine hundred three hundred ninety times by fifteen. Okay, right. So it should have been that that cost in there. It was actually that. So we've got less cost than we should have had. It's a favourable one. That is also true. Yay. Variances can be expressed as a percentage of the budget amount to determine the significance. Yeah, of course you can. That makes it make, makes it sensible. So let's say I had a, a sales variance of five hundred pounds on a million pounds budget. All right, it's neither here nor there. If I had a sales variance of five hundred pounds on ten thousand pounds, that's quite significant. So we will try and work out what that would be, and it's, it's useful to to know. A variance arises from comparison of actual costs from a past period. Actual costs from a past period with budgeted costs of a future period. No, not really. Um, that would be as I mean, that would be if we were testing out how good the accountant was at setting budgets. 
So it's not a variance in there though, it's more of a more of a test of competence really. If I set a, a variance that was or a budget that was massively different to actual previous costs in there, and if I have to have a very good basis to do that, that would be known as zero based budgeting and we will be sort of starting from scratch almost, but we use our actual cost typically as a, a bit of a guide uh, to, to what would happen. So, um, no, that's nothing. What we're actually talking about is within a period, now our variance is between actuals that happened and the budget that we set within a period. This is actual cost from a past period is irrelevant. And um, the only reason why we're comparing to budget costs of a future period would be to sort of complain if we were the managers are going, this finance person set me a really hard budget that wasn't fair. Uh, so that one would be false. Okay, marvellous. Right, let's do B. What is Jane Tinder? Has produced oh Jay Tinder has produced a performance report. So it's a, a person run the company. Jay Tinder has produced a performance report detailing budget and actual costs for the last month. So we've got some budgets. Oh, we're going to go adverse and variable, right? All right, okay. Then. So materials is a cost, right? So we've got more actuals than than budget. So that's going to be adverse. Direct labour, we've got less labour cost than budget. So that's going to be favourable. Production overheads, we've got more production overheads than we budget for, so that's going to be adverse. Administration overheads, there's less administration overheads than we budgeted for, so that would be favourable. Selling and distribution overheads, there's less selling and distribution overheads than we budgeted for, so that is also favourable. That's that. Right, task number 13. Train Limited requires a performance report for detailing the budgeted uh, data, actual data, and variances for last month. Budgeted data for the month include, right, so there's our budget. Okay, so we've got our budget in here. We're going to have our actuals and we're going to do our variance. Okay, fair enough then. Uh, budget. Actual. We're going to go vari variance as well. And we're going to go type. Okay. Right, so we're going to go, our sales should be, so what we wanted to, we, th we thought we should sell 5,200 and we should sell them at 40 pounds per unit. So we should sell that. We actually sold that. Boo. Uh, we're not doing, that's not going as, as well as we wanted it to be. And here, so we, we will have a lower, lower figure than we should have there. Um, now, I'm going to do this the way that, which it would be in the exam. So the exam would be a figure like that with this version here called adverse. There, and that's what it would look like. Now, in actual fact, in reality, nobody's ever done it like that. What they've always done is, is the actual minus that minus figure, because you've got them both together. It's more efficient. Um, nobody in the history of the world ever put on their management accounts a positive variant, positive figure like that. And an adverse number next to it. Um, right, material. So it's, we were budgeted 4,300 times by 15 pounds per kilo. Now, 64,800. So we have, um, that was our budget. That's what it actually cost. Not doing very well in this one, really. Um, so 300 pounds adverse. Because it costs more than we thought it should do. Okay. In terms of our labour cost, then 3,750 hours at 25 pounds per hour. Okay. It actually costs us less. Yay. It costs us less. So 1,050 pounds favourable. Our costs were less than we thought it should be, so that should be favourable. And then the overheads were 1,428,000. 1, we thought they should be 120,000, 27,800, so that's less cost than we thought we should have. 200, favourable. Must confess, in something of a pointless task, really would look like that in a set of management accounts, realistically. Um, there, well, actually, what it would do is it wouldn't look that. Sorry, it would look that would be the right. But then the other ones, because they're costs, we would take 
the budget figure and we'll deduct off the cost like that. See how that one is minus? Like that. And that would be how our total variances would look as well. Um, to just give you a and to sales minus the costs in here. That's, ooh, that's not very good, is it? But you can see how our actual cost, our actual loss is more than our budgeted one in here by that difference. That's how it would normally look. Right, let's go to is that the end of it's only task 13, right? Okay. Task 14. Uh, Thomas Limited requires the budget report below for the last month to be completed. In particular, they want production cost variances expressed as a percentage of budget. Okay, so we're going to have some production cost variances and we're going to have them in materials, labour and production overheads. Okay. Right, so material, labour and overheads. And we've got our budget over here. And let's see what it actually turns out, out as. So it's the materials are the cost. So it'd be favourable if we got a lower cost than we should have. And it actually costs us 127300. So that's great because it's less, isn't it? So we've got a positive variance of 3700. But let's see how significant it is, how important it is. So it's that divided by the opening budget figure 2.8. Um, you can see how, what do they want? They want it as a percentage of budget rounded to two decimal places. I'm going to show you a bit of Excel here. Round, you know, I think it is two. No, round one. Ah, three. Right, okay, there we go. Right, here we go. Three. So we've got that to two decimal places. Are we going percentages? No, we won't. We have, have to go to four there. Okay then, and I'll format that. And the only reason why I'm doing that is to get you used to later on the, um, you need to be able to do these kind of things. So in terms of actually doing that in Excel as the, as the equation, it's equals round. So we're rounding it, this figure in here, N, and then we, oh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, that divided by the budget, and we're gonna round it down in this instance four, because that's what Excel does uh, it requires four to get to that that sort of two decimal places here and looking like that in in percentage terms really because that's what they seem to ask for percentage percentage of the budget rounded to two decimal places so it would look like that right okay labor budget 1390 okay so 139,000 for labor oh my word it cost us a lot 144200 okay so the difference between those two is it's an adverse variance. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make that a positive figure. So 5,200. You know, we've got 5,200 more than what we should have in here. Um, and that will be 3.74 3 as the variance. <coughs> and then in terms of overheads, we budgeted 130,000. We have 136,200. So we've got a lot more cost that we should have in the hair. So we've got a variance of 6,200 uh, and the significance is 4.77. In this question, actually, it's a poor question because really, if you're going to do it like this, um, you would have to have the adverse and the positive there. They don't like to have these sort of negative figures in it. So there would be, there would be a requirement to put adverse and positive in there because that one is a positive variance and these two are negative but they look quite similar to be quite confusing to the reader of the reader of the accounts so it would never look like that in reality how it would look is it would look like this in here with that minus that uh, it would look like that that would how it would look on a set of management accounts um but not in, not in an exam question right but in the exam question for here as well, we would also have this adverse and positive here alongside it. Right. Uh, Walden Limited makes tables and chairs. Great. Okay. Last month's performance for Walden Limited is summarized in the table below. Any variance in excess of 5% of budget is deemed to be significant, which means that somebody will either be getting congratulated or be in trouble. Uh, and should we report to the relevant managers for review and appropriate action? Okay. So that's why, that's why we use these variances and why we sometimes use a significance thing. What we're going to go and do, what's worth going and doing it, we're not going to chase down everything, but we sort of, we have what's known as reporting by exception. 
So we, we do that and we then go and sort of um, work out who's doing what. Um, so we've got a budget. We've got an actual variance in here. Examine the variance in the table to determine whether they're significant or not. All right, okay. So we've got this variance in here. So we're going to go 6395 divided by 125,300. So is that figure 5%? Is it more than 5%? Yes, it is. Actually, right, I'll format these cells as well. Percentage. There you go, 5.1%. And so that is significant. Oh, I'm spelling correctly anyway. Right. Let me show you a little bit of Excel as well in here. So we're going to copy that. And we're going to highlight these ones because I want to do. I want to have the format. And we're going to right click in here. And we're going to paste special. I'm going to see paste our formats. You'll do that in level three, right? So um, equals next one six four four three divided by one three one five hundred four point nine equals two seven five zero oh, divided by six six seven five zero oh, equals three seven one eight divided by seven two nine zero. Oh. Okay, so significant, not significant, not significant, and significant. Okay, it's just a test of maths, really. Um, the point behind it is, is we're trying to work out um, what we're going to go and do and who we're going to review. You must confess, they're not that that this idea of, of, of we're going to go and do that, we're going to go investigate that, but not that. Um, is a bit ridiculous. Right, okay. Identify whether the following statements are true or false. Okay. Uh, the variance for the direct materials cost of the tables department should be reported to the purchasing manufacturer. So, right, okay. So, now what we're going to do is, is we've got an issue and who we're going to report it to, who's going to do what. So, we're the management. Now, this idea of reporting to is, turned, is, is quite interesting. What actually is going to be happening is, is, is that the manager is going to have to explain the issue. So, reported to is, is, is one thing, but that's an awful, like, a would you mind awfully telling me why it is that things have gone wrong in your department. Uh, so, what it actually is, is more like you're going to tell them and you're going to require an answer back from them. Right, so the variances for the direct material cost, the tables department should be reported to the purchasing manager. So, direct materials cost variance in here. And we've got a purchasing manu merchant manager. So the reason why the direct materials cost has gone wrong in the tail department, it could be that we've had to go and buy, it's cost us more to buy each material. This purchasing manager has not been that great at their job, actually, to be fair. And uh, the cost has gone through the roof in there because they've been poor at actually buying stuff. They've been costing us more than it should be. In reality, these, these costs get split into a, a different thing in terms of the cost, the actual price, the items and also the usage of it but that one could be yeah, that will be a true it's costing you cost us more you've gone out and you've, you've cost us a lot more than uh, what we thought it should do your buying has not been that great uh, why is that the case the variances for the direct labor cost of the table department should be reported to the production manager for the chairs department okay why would we be bothering the production manager for the chairs department with the direct labor cost of the tables department. We'd be asking the, the production manager of the tables department why it is the direct labor cost is different in that, uh, but we wouldn't be asking the production manager of the chairs department. That would be false. And if you've been in a lesson with me, you'll know that I sort of think, you know, in terms of an accountancy point of view, you ride into town like the Lone Ranger, uh, sort of explaining, requiring people to sort of sort out their lives and what have you in here. I don't know why on earth you won't go and discuss with the uh, production manager of the chairs department what's going on in the tables department, set a bit of a gossip in there though, which would be wholly inappropriate. Right, the various department for the various for the direct labor cost of the chairs department should be reported to the sales manager. Right, so the sales manager is responsible for sales, isn't it? Not responsible for the direct labor of, of uh, the, the chairs. Then no, no, you'll be going and asking the production manager what's going on in, in the chairs. So that one's going to be false. The variance for the direct materials cost of the chairs department should be reported to the production manager for the chairs department. Okay. So we got direct materials cost of chairs reported to the production manager for chairs. Okay, so we've got the same thing in here. 
and this person is using the stuff. So that one is going to be a true. Right, now let's let's change this one here. So we've got direct materials cost variance here to a purchase manager. We've got direct materials cost here to a production manager. Yeah. And now let's assume that they were the same department. So we've got table. Let's say they're now both chairs. One of them is going to be. It's going to. We're now going into this meeting. Um, we've got an adverse variance against our chairs department in this case of a hundred thousand pounds. Let's say in here, somebody's messed up. Uh, who is it? And what we're going to do? If we just go along with one variance figure and say, well, it's all gone wrong in there, though, the purchasing, man purchasing manager is going to point the finger at the production manager and it just wastes loads and loads and loads and loads of money. And, there, and, the, um, and the production manager is there going to be going and pointing the finger at the purchasing manager and going, oh, he or she just has you know, gone and it cost us way more because you just couldn't be bothered. They're really lazy and they get on with, their, with these people anyway. They didn't bother to put anything to tender. Uh, they're useless as a purchasing manager. Uh, there's a lot of finger pointing going on and we didn't really get any, any further forward. Um, I don't know, second both if you want to. Uh, what actually you do in, in reality is you split it into two uh, variances, this particular one. You know, one about the price per, per, per raw material and the other one about what we actually used you know, per, per material as well. Uh, but what you're basically doing, as a general to get this, this question right, is somebody's lost you a lot of money um, and you want to find out who it is. You're not going to go in and just start shouting at everybody. Um, you need to go in and actually work out who it is that I want to go and find. And you use these numbers and these variances to, to narrow it down to exactly who it is, which manager it is. And then we're going to find out what the reason is. Is it because factors have changed and we need to consider that in terms of our price? Or alternatively, is it a performance issue? In which case we need to, we need to consider performance of, of that, that particular staff member. That's the purpose of these variances. Um, and that's it. Right, that is the whole of task number or, or BPP um, practice assessment number one. Not sure how long that, that took there, probably about an hour and a half, but there was a load of explanations going on as well. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, good luck. We'll see you in the next one.